Our scripture comes today first from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then from 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 7. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Winston Churchill, the great British Prime Minister, was a great wit. He could be surly and dour at times, but he was also very precocious and funny, even when he was insulting people. Once, when Harry Truman was commenting on Churchill's political opponent, a man named Clement Attlee, Truman said, well, Attlee seems to be a very modest fellow. To which Churchill replied, well, he's got a lot to be modest about. A society lady named Bessie Braddock once scolded Churchill publicly at a party saying, why, Winston, you're drunk. To which Churchill replied, yes, Bessie, I am. But tomorrow morning I will be sober and you will still be ugly. While Churchill could be caustic in that way, he was also a great uniter of people as well, holding the United Kingdom and its fractious empire together uh, during the great conflict of the Second World War. After the war, the empire fell apart, but during the conflict, Churchill was able to keep Brits and Aussies, New Zealanders and Indians, free French and exiled Poles, Canadians and East Africans, among a host of others, all pulling together to help defeat the Nazis. All these nations and peoples had different ideas, political leanings, religious beliefs, cultures, desires, aspirations, but they were united in being appalled by the brutal methods, goals, desires, and actions of the Nazi regime and by their determination to not be conquered by such a deadly dictatorship. They stood shoulder to shoulder to defeat the Nazis and their allies. It was no small task at all, but they endured it, soldiered on, and came out victorious in the end because they stood together. We are used to seeing strife and division in the world around us. Yet recently, we have increasingly seen strife and conflict even in our own country. People are on edge after a year of lockdowns, isolating and distancing from one another. People are on edge after the brutal election season and its shocking aftermath that we just went through. People are on edge worrying about their jobs and bills and health and families. This edginess has caused divisions to run more deeply and more strongly than they ever have in recent memory. If we remain deeply divided, however, we will only have a slim hope of successfully facing the challenging times ahead of us as we go through the rest of this pandemic and the economic and political trials that surround it and that it spawned. We faced a year of it so far, but it appears that there's still yet more to come. We will have some surprises ahead of us, no doubt. Some will be good and some will be bad. Regardless, we need to pull together like the British Empire did as it faced the challenges of World War II, knowing that the cost of failure is much too high. So we might ask ourselves, how do we get along with and work alongside of folks who we may not agree with, who we might actively even disagree with, or who we may not even like much at all, uh, even if we like them at all? I think scripture can help us out in answering that question. The first thing that we can do is to try and see things and people through God's eyes as much as we're able to do so in our imperfect human way. By this, I do not mean looking at folks and the way that they are or the way that they're acting or being and saying, aha, God sure would not like that. What I am talking about is encapsulated in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. God so loved humanity that he willingly sent his only begotten son, who willingly came to suffer so that we might be saved. God so loved the world, not just people like you and me, not just people that think like us or act like we do or that we like, not just people who agree with us, 
but everyone. We read further in 1 Timothy 2 that God would that all people should be saved. God so loves us, all of us, that his wish is that we would all be saved. Who is and isn't saved, well, that's a different discussion for a different time. At this juncture, we're talking about how God sees the world and about how God sees humanity. And we can see here that God loves us, all of us, each and every one of us. No, he doesn't love all that we do. He doesn't love the ways that we live sometimes or the things that we do, maybe the things that we have sometimes even become. But he loves each of us. There are things about us that God certainly doesn't like. But God loves us as people. And if God can so love us, even in things that we do wrong, and at times when we are at our worst, surely we can try to see things as God does and to love one another, even if, and especially if and when, we may not like what a person does or thinks or even who we may think they are. We can look at a person and say, like me, that person is a soul created and loved by God. That person is a person just like me that God wants to save just as much as he wants to save me. If God can love so, then we can certainly strive mightily to love so. We can do it as a witness to others. We can do it as an example of how the kingdom of God is supposed to work. We can do it because we're commanded to do so. The great commandment of Jesus to his disciples, love one another as I first loved you. And we can do it in causes that bring us all together for the greater good and benefit of all of us. <coughs> Excuse me. Secondly, we can see in this passage from Timothy that we are urged that, that we are to give supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings, and that they're to be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of our Savior, Scripture says. So we are to pray for and give thanksgivings for all people, especially those in high places, not just some, but all. Why? So that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life, a good life for all of us, a peaceful and quiet and godly and dignified life, it says. This pleases our Savior, we're told. Our prayers are carried out in the actions we take in faith of our prayers and the Lord's answers to them. So we pray, and then we do, in the love of the Lord and as a witness to him, so that all of us can live together in a peaceful and joyful life. We do this already, of course, in parts. Our jobs may require us to get along with folks we may not otherwise get along with. When there is an emergency, we can see the most unlikely people pull together to help one another. On a more regular basis, we can see it in our communities when our churches of different denominations work together to worship and serve the Lord. But maybe we need to look even a little further afield and at even bigger differences than those. How about those folks whose cultures are very different from our own? Those whose beliefs are very different from our own? Those whose lives and expectations are very different from our own. Those both near and far who we may not even be able to begin to comprehend how somebody could believe the way they do. Let us be even more committed than before in living and loving as a witness to the Lord, even in and especially in those situations and among those folks that we just don't understand or get along with. Not just putting up with one another, but actively loving one another and helping one another. I saw a video the other day that showed what they call a flash mob assembly. A flash mob is when someone sends out a message on social media for anyone who wants to come to assemble at a particular place and time for a particular purpose. The people mostly don't even know each other, and there's no telling who is going to show up. Excuse me again. <coughs> This particular flash mob on the video was to assemble in a certain city's central square with whatever instruments they could bring in order to play Beethoven's Ode to Joy. If they didn't have instruments, people could come, bring their voices, and sing. It started out with a single man playing a bass cello in the middle of the square. 
As people gathered to watch, the sound of his single instrument was almost lost in the space of that square. But soon he was joined in ones and twos and threes and then by dozens more, carrying violins and clarinets and flutes and trumpets and horns and drums and bells and voices. At the end, dozens of people, united only by their love of music, played this beautiful song more wonderfully than a paid orchestra could have to the enjoyment of the gathered crowd. One or two of them could have made a joyful noise. A couple hundred of them made a moving and stirring moment. This is what we should be, a symphony, showing up and willing to work with whoever comes for the betterment of us all, for the peace of all, for the benefit of all. Even if we don't agree on everything, even if we don't agree on anything, we are to love as God loves us, wholeheartedly, unreservedly, no matter who it is.